Hello and welcome to Bolt Action Reloading. Today we are going to update our ultimate guide to 6.5 Creedmoor Brass with velocity and group information. So stick around! Welcome to the channel! If this is your first time here and you want to learn how I and the rest of the community here make our group smaller, start now by subscribing to the channel and clicking the bell icon. That way you get notified when I post new videos and you won't miss anything. In today's video, we are going to discuss the data that we used to generate the velocity graphs that we showed in last week's video. I really want to thank all the guys for your comments last week. I will certainly be checking out the Peterson Brass and see if I can get some to evaluate. I certainly didn't want to wait any longer though to go through the velocity data, so guys, here we go. In last week's video, we covered our brass weight variation, case volume information, neck wall thickness variation, overall length, run out, and a quick velocity comparison from all of our brass, which was from Lapua, Norma, Hornady, Starline, in both large and small rifle, SIG, as well as Federal. You might not be interested in all the information, but hopefully you found at least some of it useful. If you missed the last video, I'll put a card up so you can check it out. But today we're going to go over the actual velocity and groups that we shot with that brass to generate this data. So for the discussion today, we are going to talk about the loads we loaded with IMR 4350. We actually used all the rest of the IMR4350 that I had in stock, loading the last of these loads. One thing of note before we get started, for reference, when the test was initially done with Lapua, Norma, and Hornady, which was several months before the rest of this brass came out, the Federal Match Primers were used. Since then, I've done some further testing, and mostly I've had better results with Magnum Primers in this cartridge. So when we repeated this testing on this brass for this quick fire forming workup, I did switch to Magnum Primers, hoping that we might possibly improve the results with that change. Ideally, for an identical comparison, you would try to repeat the same components, but we really weren't looking for amazing results with our fire forming loads anyway. But we did want to get a general feeling of how the case capacity and primer style might actually affect our load development, or choose one brass type over another. Since loading these were actually essentially loading fire forming loads, might as well use some inexpensive projectiles. And the inexpensive projectiles that we used last time, again, was 140 grain Nosler RDF. I've said it before on this channel, but if you're new, I'll let you know that when I initially loaded this projectile, Nosler gave me the load length of 2.775 inches. Now that didn't work extremely well, but that is what we used in the initial firing of the Hornady, Lapua, and Norma brass. In a different load test we used, not with IMR4350, we tried a cartridge overall length of 2.880, which is only about 16 thousandths off of my lands, and some of my commenters mentioned back that that was actually too close and recommend going somewhere between 40 and 50 thousandths. One more change for this test, though hopefully it's not a drastic change to affect the velocity, we actually also moved the cartridge overall length to 2.862 inches. While this won't be a perfect comparison, Hopefully moving the cartridge overall length to 2.862 inches, maybe we'll be able to find an overall length that shoots a little bit better for this projectile, as well as still see how the primer size, case capacity, and brass type might affect the performance of our loads going forward. So for a quick summary, we're going to put our case capacity chart back up from last week, just so we can remember. Assuming that the lowest case capacity would generate the highest charge for the same charge weight, we assume the star line, small rifle or large rifle will generate the highest loads, going on to Lapua, Sig, Norma, Federal, and Hornady, or somewhere in that neighborhood, give or take a little bit. But somehow what we predict doesn't always come to fruition. Talking strictly about that highest charge, and again, the book value on this told us we would have hit 2731. Sig actually provided the highest velocity, followed not too far behind by Hornady. Then the next two right on top of each other was both the Norma and the star line, large rifle, then Lapua, Starline Small Rifle, and Federal. We could argue all day about what information we can and cannot take out of this data set. I did think it would be interesting to put a chart, so I'll put the velocity chart back on the screen that I showed you guys from last week, except I'm going to throw the estimated velocity line on there, just to show kind of all the charges came a little bit below that estimated velocity. It was fairly cool out when I tested both of these, though it was cooler for the second round of testing, which was the Starline SIG and Federal Brass. I did allude to this in last week's video. When we talk about this kind of brass, guys, one of the things that does come up is the small rifle versus large rifle primer. Which one you should select, the, the pluses and minuses to that. I'll throw that chart up there one more time. Um, just generates more conversation and argument. Certainly some more testing will be done. I'm not going to say that this is the end-all to end-all test by any stretch of the imagination. But I did find it interesting that basically both of the small rifle primer, which was the Starline as well as Lapua, the small rifle primer bass, both from Lapua and Starline, seemed to follow the same trend. As that charge weight increased, the actual velocity did not increase the same rate as the large rifle primer brass that we tested. 
Certainly some more testing could be done to test this out, but keep in mind both our large and small rifle primer brass and from Starline as well as Lapa had almost identical case volume. So to see a reasonably different velocity such as this, it really does make me wonder, you know, is that large rifle primer providing the ignition that this cartridge is really meant to deal with? We'll kick that topic aside and move on to the next. So we could certainly argue all day that the velocity that these loads achieved wasn't really super important. You could always add a little bit more powder to get a little bit more velocity. However, one of the things we're always shooting for is to get lower standard deviations. And so I put this chart up. If it's not self-explanatory, obviously over the, the five shot scoop we, we shot with each type of brass, that uh, you'll see the standard deviations that we got with that. I'm unnecessarily penalizing SIG a little bit here. I do want to mention that SIG was actually received the short end of the stick on the 41.5 grain charge because I ran out of powder when I was trying to fill those last five cases. And so I actually only got two charged to the proper 41.5 grains and I have fire formed the other three cases with a different powder. The three cases have been omitted and so obviously the data generated for the 41.5 grain statistics for SIG is only a two shot sample. But speaking only in generalities, obviously this is fire forming. We don't expect perfect standard deviations, but if we were to compare these, certainly Norma and Lapo will win the day with the only ones in single digit standard deviations. Hornady and the Starline small rifle seem to hold their own, holding right about the same, just under 12. And the other three styles in somewhere in the ballpark of 20 really isn't a desirable area to be. However, again, this is fire forming. If we reran this test after the case has been fire formed, it's very likely those statistics would greatly improve, or at least we'd certainly hope so. So guys, let's talk about the groups a little bit. I will throw this chart on there though. To me, it's a certainly a little bit more meaningful to actually see the groups them themselves rather than just seeing how they measured out. Though if you were going to take the average group size, keep in mind these groups were at 150 yards. This is translated into MOA. SIG actually wins the day with the lowest average group size. And keep in mind that is omitting the data from the 41.5 grain charge since there was only two shots in that group. Even with the, admitting that 243 MOA, SIG still won the day in that area. The Starline small rifle was very close behind. Then believe it or not, Federal, the Norma, Lapua, Hornady, and the Starline large rifle. Not earth shattering information here guys. This was fire forming charge weight, but so at least to me, interesting data nonetheless. But like I said, guys, I really thought this actually looking at the groups would be a little bit more interesting. We'll run through the groups starting with Lapua at the 39.5 grain charge. We got 1.288 MOA. At 40, we got 0.629 MOA. At the 40.5 grain charge gave us 1.087 MOA. At 41, we got 0.937 MOA. 41.5, 0.913 MOA. Moving on to Norma, 1.069 MOA at 39.5. At 40, 1.08 MOA. At 40.5, we drop down to 0.422 MOA. At 41 grains, 0.956 MOA. At 41.5, 0.71 MOA. At 39.5 grains, Hornady gave us 1.238 MOA. At 40 grains, 1.463 MOA. 40.5, 1.163 MOA. 41 grains, 0.689 MOA. And 41.5 grains, 0.97 MOA. Starting with our new kids on the block, the Starline small rifle at 39.5 generated 0.691 MOA. At 40 grains, 0.634 MOA. At 40.5, 1.052 MOA. 41 was just over an MOA. 41.5 was 0.703 MOA. The SIG, and you'll kind of see those numbers, and too, I think when you see the groups, you'll agree with me that I, if you were picking groups and didn't see any other velocity or statistical information, which is one of the reasons why I really believe velocity and statistics are so important when you're choosing your load. At 39.5 grains, SIG gave us 0.442 MOA. At 40 grains, it held a 0.579 MOA. And at 40.5 grains, we got 0.588 MOA. At 41 grains though, we did open up to 1.125 MOA. And like I mentioned guys, with only two shots, 0.243 MOA probably isn't a very accurate prediction of what that group size would have been had we actually had five shots to do it with. Moving on to the Starline large rifle at 39.5 was 0.951 MOA. At 40 grains, it was 0.913 MOA. 40.5 opened up as well to 1.322 MOA. 41 grains was 0.86 MOA. 41.5 grains was 1.952 MOA, which certainly largely brought the average for the Starline large rifle much larger. Last but not least, at 39.5 grains, the Federal Brass gave us 0.931 MOA. At 40 grains is 0.887 MOA. 
at 40.5 grains, 0.83 MOA, at 41 grains, 0.956 MOA, and the top charge of 41.5 grain gave us 0.691 MOA. Well guys, I realized that was a lot of information in a small group. I figured if you guys really wanted to see that information, you can go back and pause those and stare at them to your heart's content. But that was all of the statistical information that we got while we did the load workup on these seven different kinds of brass. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, if I do get some more different styles of brass tubes, I may very well update it. Probably not any longer with the IMR 4350. Maybe we'll go back and reshoot everything with a fire form load to give a more interesting comparison. However, I hope both of these videos have given you some interesting information to think about when you choose your next brass selection. If you have any comments or questions on the video, please put those in the comment section below. If you're not subscribed to the channel and you like the content, consider subscribing to the channel to see more crazy stuff like this, and please hit that like button. Please make sure you guys tune in next week, and until then, stay safe in small groups.